let's say they take Taiwan, that's in the first island chain. You still have the second island chain, which can be completely blockaded off, and then your whole economy is ruined. The Jorkesh Patel interview of SCM Payne has gone viral, and I am happy to see this as someone who has been reading SCM Payne for years, specifically her book Wars for Asia is essential reading when it comes to understanding why Asia is the way it is today, and especially understanding China. And I'm so happy to see the thousands of people who viewed her interview and who are having an active discussion over what she said. So I've decided today to add to that discussion. So let's get started. Her most important and most interesting point, in my opinion, was that the U.S. does not need to defend Taiwan, that the U.S. does not need to use its military force in the event of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan to make China stop. Because SCM Payne operates in this maritime power versus continental power dichotomy. And she sees China as a continental power that is completely reliant on trade. Shortly after the interview, I watched one of her lectures where she was discussing this in more detail. And then I did some research on my own, um, specifically looking at when she was describing how much more efficient a cargo ship is than a train. A cargo ship is basically around 220 times the capacity of a cargo train. And if we think about a pipeline, because 17% of China's natural gas does come through a pipeline, a pipeline is only four times more efficient than a tanker ship. So you can see the massive difference in scale there. Basically, China is an export-oriented economy that takes in inputs by sea. Think about coal from overseas and then oil from overseas as well. And then it assembles these inputs and then ships back out these assembled products back out through the ocean uh, to Western markets and increasingly nowadays the global south. So because of this, when your economy is tied up in trade, when you became rich through being an export-oriented economy, once a blockade happens against you, which is what would happen in the event of an invasion with Taiwan um, imposed by uh, the US, uh, the Philippines, Korea, Japan, and probably Vietnam also, your economy basically collapses. These are my books, most of which I read back when I was studying international relations in college. The number one book that you need to read to know about China is definitely Henry Kissinger on China. No, not the best person, but an incredible author and explaining concepts in a very simple way. And this is definitely the number one book on China. The book that I want to talk about here, though, for this point is this one here, Cheap Threats, Why the United States Struggles to Coerce Weak States. And after reading this, I became convinced that sanctions are a really bad way to pursue national policy. SCM Payne changed my mind in one minute during that interview. And it's such a simple thought that I'm amazed I didn't think of it earlier. Just goes to show that you are learning something new every day. But the point of sanctions, it's not to stop an economy from growing. It's to hurt it just little by little so that over time with the effects of compounding, the economy becomes much weaker than it would have been otherwise. So the goal is to not stop growth but to slow it. And during the interview, Dwarkesh Patel gave the example, I believe the time frame was at the US 1850 to 1900, the GDP per capita growth um, stalled by, by just 1% um, per year, um, less than what it actually was. The US would never become a richer country um, than Brazil. And we're seeing that today um, with the sanctions against Russia. And this would be really disastrous in the case of China because China doesn't have the luxury that Russia does where well, Russia basically built a, a self-sufficient economy um, because it has lots of natural resources, especially oil, and it was recently buying up gold, which also is something China is doing um, right now. But unlike China, Russia is not an export-oriented economy. So because of that, the Chinese have such an obstacle in that, sure, let's say they take Taiwan, that's in the first island chain. You still have the second island chain which can be completely blockaded off, and then your whole economy is ruined. So it doesn't matter if like what recently happened when your trade with the global south actually overtakes your trade with the West, because those Western powers and your allies will cut off all of your trade to the global south. 
The second point here is when I start to disagree with SCM Payne, it's as though she has this idea of the benevolent maritime power, uh, like the British Empire that always goes around promoting trade. And she doesn't think about the cases when the maritime power cares about its own internal uh, markets more than promoting trade. Um, and she gave the example of the Holly Smoot Tariff Act of 1931, which effectively led to war with Japan, because again, just like China, Japan, an export-oriented economy, and then we raised tariffs that led to a complete destruction of Japan's economy and really gave them no choice than to pursue empire, where they had resources directly under their control, rather than trading with the rest of the world. And I would argue the U.S. is doing this right now with China. We just saw Janet Yellen go to Beijing and announce new trade restrictions and really talk down um, to the Chinese in a way I disagree with. We should be promoting trade um, with the Chinese at this point. Um, the CCP is going to be around for a long time, whether we want it or not. No matter how many people keep saying the collapse of the CCP is imminent, they're a force that we're going to have to work with. Because at the end of the day, it's better to have them in this international system as a global player than without it. Because as long as they're in it, that's where we have the highest chance of peace. And it's where I really disagree with um, our current and past administration for that matter. Um, for our trade policy um, with the Chinese. And it's something that I wish SC and Payne would be pressed on a little bit more. It's definitely something that I would ask her there because I just think it's a bit incongruent um, with the rest of her arguments. I think um, at least since the start of the Biden administration, it has al always been the U.S. Um, basically that has been pushing China um, into, a, into a corner. Um, nothing there that would warrant this type of response from the U.S. The only explanation is that the U.S. is just scared um, and it wants to protect its, its internal markets. And at the end, this is increasing um, the risks of war. And this is what happens. This is exactly what happened with Japan in 1931. Only in this case, it's it's worse because now we've surrounded China with our allies. And then on the economic front, um, we're acting that way. But also on the military front, um, you have to remember as well how concerning that can be um, to Beijing, this, this regime that has been forged by you know, the pain of the century uh, of humiliation. And it's as though we're acting just like those Western powers in the past um, and trying to constrain China. So again, this is something I really wish that SC and Payne would have been pressed on a little bit more. Definitely a question that I would ask her um, because I think it really exposes the conflict of interest here and that she does work for the US government, as she pointed out many times in that interview, specifically for um, the US Navy. So I think there are some things here um, that she isn't able to say um, concerning a U.S. national policy. And if you look at the Plaza Accords um, that the United States did against Japan, that'd be another um, example there where kind of our eagerness to protect our internal markets um, led to economic problems in Japan yet again. Um, and this is a different situation than what we have in, in China now, because while we're trying to protect our, our internal markets, they're not like Japan, they're not in the U.S. Um, alliance system. So it really is a whole different ballgame where, you know, there really could be um, conflict um, because of this. That wasn't a possibility um, when we had the, the Plaza Accords. The next point I thought was super interesting and really made me think more about China's economy was S.C. and Payne's whole argument that planned economies are inefficient in the long run. And specifically, she used the example of communist regimes. They're, they're really good at, at centralized planning. I mean, think of China. They almost always finish all of their objectives in every single five-year plan, and that this centralized planning works best when the country's in a state of rebuilding um, after a war, in the case of the Soviet Union, or during a period of um, opening up and um, infrastructure construction, like in communist China um, after Deng Xiaoping. And you have very high GDP growth during this infrastructure period. But after that, centralized economies, they tend to struggle there to promote innovation um, and growth on its own. And this is something that really remains to be seen whether China can overcome this hurdle because China seems to be moving now away from its tried and true infrastructure spending into really two different directions. Um, a, they're trying to fix their, their housing woes. Um, they see that private developers um, are the problem. Although confusingly, while promoting middle-class public housing, it seems they're also trying to bail out um, these housing developers, which is a lesson we should have learned from the 2008 um, crisis in, in this country, and that eventually just going to get another another bubble um, forming back again. So I think that's very short sighted of the CCP um, policy there. But they understand that that's a speculative market that they have to get 
under control for now. And the second thing is to not have a future based in in infrastructure spending, which I think they understand is um is inefficient um in the long run that you need um private or state owned firms that promote growth. Um, so they're going in the direction of focusing on their new energies of electric vehicles and battery production. It remains to be seen whether that is a winning bet. Um, it goes back to what I was saying before. Um, now trade with the global south has surpassed trade um, with the west. So China does have an export market, but it remains to be seen whether they've chosen um, the right products here. They know that they've lost um, to the Americans in terms of the semiconductor race, and now they feel slighted in that their access to that semiconductor technology is becoming completely limited. Really, electric vehicles and battery production, that's the one thing um, that they're doing better um, than the West, and it makes the West, especially Europe, um, very nervous in that they could have a lot of Chinese um, EVs coming. But really, in the bigger picture, um, you have to think that the global South is going to become that increasingly important market. So it remains to be seen whether they're doubling down on industries um, really works, um, because that is something that is you know a problem inherent to, to um, centralized planned economies is that we really haven't seen them ever uh, create that successful services sector. And it's even more difficult in China because uh, like Japan, you have a very low domestic savings rate. Um, as I say on this channel many times, you have about 1.4 billion you know, consumers. So Western companies are always gonna wanna be in China. You're gonna have um, Apple, you're gonna have uh, a Tesla, um, Samsung. They're always gonna be in the Chinese market just because of the, of the size. But in terms of creating you know, a services-based economy and really move from middle income to high income, you can't do it in that way, which is why they're doubling down on industry because they have 30% of the world's industrial capacity. It really is an insane number, um, if you think about it, that they, that they can leverage um, going forward. But again, it will only work if they continue having their trade access. So they really can't invade Taiwan because that would become um, cut off. Um, so in the future, I hope that the U.S. we really do back off from such a such an anti-trade position um, with China, um, because at the end of the day, if we force the Chinese to be um, self-sufficient, if we force them to stop valuing the U.S. market to send um, the products, then really, what's the risk of them going to war with us? It is going to be it's going to be very little. Um, who cares if their market access to the U.S. gets cut off? They weren't even trading um, with us in the first place. So again, we have to be cooperative. And we have to work um, together here. Um, and SCM Payne she just seems to act like the the maritime power that they are, you know, all dominant um, in terms of their their control um, of trade, which just simply isn't the the case here. Um, we again, we do have that great continental power um, of China, and the U.S. can't simply do whatever it wants to protect its internal market. We have to do our our job as a maritime power, which is to promote trade, because ultimately. That's what will lead to peace, uh, regardless of whether or not China's economic policy um, will be successful, um, which remains to be seen. So those are my main thoughts from the SCM Payne interview with Dwarkesh Patel. I will definitely link it in the description if you want to go see it. Um, also, highly suggest you buy her books, especially um, Wars for Asia. Excellent read. Will teach you so much. And I'm again, I'm so happy that um, as a community, you know, international affairs community, a U.S.-China foreign relations um, community, we're having such a great dialogue um, around this video. And, you know, I welcome all of you um, to participate. The more we discuss these vital international issues, the more cooperation we will have and the greater our understanding we will have. And, and that leads me to really one more thing. Um, when Dwarkesh Patel asked her what was so important about the scholarship of these countries, and she said to, to know the language, and that's something that's so important. But there's something else I want to add to that, which she didn't openly say this, um, but I, I think she she meant it by, by telling her stories of how much she traveled abroad into China. But it's to travel. Um, my main issue, and this is something Jeffrey Sachs um, nails so perfectly. He recent did, recently did an interview with, with Piers Morgan, where he, he said this perfectly. It's most of the U.S. policymakers who have this China hysteria, like look at them banning um, TikTok, they've never even been to China. You know, it's ridiculous. And and SCM Payne made this great point. Um, when she was studying in the 1980s and you were so interested in Russia, the United States government had so many programs because it was the height of the Cold War to help uh, their students study Russian culture. And we don't have this today for China. It's, it's a massive blind spot in our foreign policy, you know, elite. I think everyone should should go to China and I think every Chinese person should should visit America. 
this is how you have cooperation. This is how you get over barriers and have real discussions. Um, it's just like what SCM Payne said. When you're playing a tennis match, you got to think from your opponent's perspective as well. The issue is that, um, and this is the case on YouTube today, many commentators were only thinking about America's perspective. Again, only wanting to protect America's internal market. You have to think about it from your opponent's perspective as well. And that's why SCM Payne scholarship is so important because he says, well, how do we look at this from the perspective of the Japanese? How do we look at it from the perspective of the Soviets? How do we look at it from the perspective of Xi Jinping um, today in China? And it's something that we all need to think about. And if we do, we're going to understand um, Asia, we're going to understand China, and we're going to cooperate more. And there's going to be more peace um, in the world, which is exactly what we need um, right now. So I do appreciate you watching this video. Um, I would also appreciate if you do subscribe to this channel and leave this video um, a like. Again, this is China Geopolitics Week, and I do try to discuss some um, international issues regarding uh, China, uh, their economy, also uh, without the bias of, of Western media, but also the bias of um, the very heavily pro-CCP media. So trying to form a, a middle ground where I can show off my own opinions um, and expertise, and again, encourage dialogue to promote peace. So that is my goal here on the channel. Um, so if you agree with that, definitely subscribe and leave a like on the video. And if you got them this far, I really do appreciate your time. I hope you have a wonderful day, and I do hope to see you soon. Thank you. Stay safe.